On today's episode of Bears Now by Chat Sports, I'm Harrison Graham. Press conference fluce is back. You'll know what I'm saying once we get to it here in just a moment. I don't really like it. Potential offensive line changes. I'm going to dive into a, a few different things you could try from a personnel standpoint based on uh, current guys on the roster. And then Bryce Young was benched already. And I think it's only fair to revisit that trade that Ryan Poles uh, pulled off with Carolina. Even though we're a little down on uh, some of the personnel on the Bears, uh, I still think that's one of those trades that – could go down in Bears history. So subscribe today for free. We will continue to bring you guys daily Chicago Bears content here on Bears Now. All right, let's get into this show. Coach speak, Flus. I thought Matt Eberflus had a really good offseason, and you know everybody makes it about the hair and the beard, and it is a clean look, and it's kind of a metaphor for him getting more comfortable with the media, opening up more. Well, last night after the loss and today, you're kind of seeing the old flus in terms of how he acts at press conference, which is very tight-lipped, not willing to even slightly call anybody out, and, uh, you know, at times making weird comments, and I just not a big fan of that. It's like, just say what's on your mind. Obviously, don't bury a guy, but um, I just have not been a fan of that the first two years, thought it was a good off season, and then now I feel like we're falling back into this habit, and you're just like, why? Just just say what you think. Uh, number one, I mean, this, this one was ridiculous. He was asked about the two challenges the Bears made last night, both unsuccessful. First one had no chance. Second one had very little chance. I defended it a little bit just because it would have been a game-changing play, but when you lose the first one, you probably can't throw that second one because you're going to be out of challenges. Um, he defended the challenge process. He says, we have a great system in place. Really? Because the first one was a little corner route right in front of Flus on the sideline where it was obvious to anyone watching live with the naked eye that the receiver got two feet in yet they still challenged it. Now, obviously, they have someone upstairs feeding them information, but if you listen to Flus last night, sometimes on a critical down, if they don't have enough time, you kind of have to make a judgment call and just guess. That's a pretty shitty one to guess on because it was pretty obvious that that was a first down. And again, the second one... I I'm not completely defending it, but I understand it a little more. Your offense is struggling. If you get that pick there, you're in plus 25 territory. I, I get it to an extent, especially if you have both challenges remaining. But let's be real. Neither had a chance. And then you go up there on the podium. Yeah, we have a great process in place. I love our team. I love uh, the communication with it. Really? Because that first challenge is one of the worst challenges I've ever seen. I mean, they didn't even – I, they almost didn't even review it. It was like challenge, and then like we're snapping the ball 30 seconds later because it's so obvious. I, I don't even think the officials had to go to the monitor. They just flashed it in the stadium and NRG, and they're like, oh, yeah, foot down, toe drag. Could have dragged it three times. First down, Texans. I mean, what are you doing? And then to defend that, how about this, Flus? Yeah, bad challenge by me on the first one. Uh, we got to clean up uh, when to use those challenges. No problem, like. Every coach has bad challenges, but to defend the process, I don't see how you can defend the process when uh, the challenge has virtually no chance to work. So uh, that was number one. Number two, and this was a comment that he made today, he was asked about his thoughts on the offensive line issues and the troubles there. And just kind of a weird comment here. As we pull it up on screen, he said, um, I want to get this right here. He said, quote, when you're able to run the ball, you don't get those types of pressures. Well, yes, but guess what? You couldn't run the ball. So your whole you can't have your whole scheme be, well, we have to run the ball, otherwise we're going to give up pressure. Like, obviously it's tougher if you can't run the football, but that tells me you have a plan A and no plan B. That, that, that's not an option in the NFL. Like, throughout the week when you're game planning, hey, we want to be balanced, we want to run the football. But if we can't, here are some concepts we want to go to uh, to help Caleb out, to help the offensive line out. It seemed like they wanted to run the football, and since they couldn't, they just were screwed. That, that's kind of what you're telling me there. Like, it's pretty clear through two weeks running the football might be an issue, so you better find some shit that works. I Early on, Give some credit. You found uh, some success. 
with, with the quick game, but clearly at halftime, D'Amico got on the whiteboard, got got in there and said, hey, sit on the underneath stuff, and we're going to pressure Caleb. We're going to blitz him a lot because they can't hold up with four. If we bring a fifth guy, multiple guys are going to come unblocked, and the 36 individual pressures suggest that, um, and they're not going to have a solution. And that's exactly what happened. Waldron kept trying to go lateral, kept trying shotgun runs, and, and you got killed. So you've got to have – different avenues, different things to go to when your plan A isn't working. That That's pretty alarming to me and just a weird answer from Matt Eberflus. Do you believe in Matt Eberflus as a head coach? Type B for believe, type D for don't. This will be the pinned comment on today's episode, so scroll down to the comment section and reply with a B or a D. All right, let's talk offensive line here uh, in just a moment. Some potential changes, things to explore doing. If I was Matt Eberflu, Shane Waldron, Chris Morgan, it's got to be collaborative. It can't just be one person. Uh, they've, they've really got to sit down hard today and tomorrow before Wednesday's practice and explore some different offensive line possibilities. I'll dive into some of my suggestions here in just a moment. But first, got to show some love to our sponsor, Game Time. If you're looking to get out of the house this fall, go to a football game, check out the Bulls once basketball season starts, the Blackhawks, or any other sporting event, concert, or comedy show, Game Time, the ticketing sponsor of this show, is the place to go. Their new feature, Game Time Picks, makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams much easier as it'll filter out the fluff to show you the best deals on the best seats so you don't have to filter through thousands of tickets. Whether you're getting tickets for a sporting event, concert, comedy show, or anything else, Game Time has you covered in their app with views from the seats. Super deals, which essentially highlight the best bang for your buck on certain events. Sometimes you get little discounts there. And last-minute tickets for the lowest price guaranteed. If you find a cheaper ticket on a different ticketing service in the same row and section, screenshot, send it to Game Time, they will lower that price for you. So download the Game Time app today. Use code CHATSPORTS, it's all one word, for $20 off your first purchase only right now. It's code CHATSPORTS for $20 off. Terms apply. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Link is in the comments and in the description of this video. All right, you look at the offensive line. Clearly through two games, and I know in the first game, Ryan Bates and Nate Davis rotated at right guard, but that's the point's moot. It has not been good enough. I think we all know that. Even if you're not a football evaluator, it's not hard to see, hey, that, that number 18 guy, he's getting hit a lot. Why is that? Well, the offensive line isn't doing a very good job. So here are five things I would consider. Number one, and I said it earlier, I would cut Nate Davis, but I think you got to at least bench him. And I'm not trying to make this all about Nate Davis because I don't think it's all about Nate Davis. But I get some Claypool vibes where it's like maybe just cutting ties, even if it's not actually improving the personnel by a ton, maybe just from a vibe standpoint it's better – I don't know what happens behind closed door. Maybe he's super tight with everybody on the team and he's a good vibes guy. I don't know. It just fell off from the beginning and I get the family tragedy and that's hard and maybe his head's not in football. And I would certainly understand if that was the case. But if it is, football's a sport. You can't be halfway in. It's too violent. It's too physical. It's too mentally draining. You're either in or you're out. It doesn't seem like he's all the way in, so I would bench Nate Davis. And then I would try Matt Pryor. Whether it's at right or left guard, I'll get to that reasoning in a second, but I thought Matt Pryor in the preseason, again, preseason, it only means so much, I understand, but I thought he at least held his own. He's a seven-year vet. He's stuck around the NFL for a reason. He can play tackle, he can play guard. Am I expecting crazy high-level play from Matt Pryor? No, but part of Nate Davis's issues have been just technical things and effort at times. I would expect Matt Pryor to give me 100% effort. And that's the bare minimum, so that is something I would consider. How about moving Tevin Jenkins to right guard? I think this can have a multiple effect. One, I've always felt like he was more comfortable at right guard. He's been a good left guard, albeit week 18 last year, first two games this year haven't been great for him. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but I think he'd be a little more comfortable over there. And B, you put him next to Darnell Wright, who is coming off probably the worst game of his career – but at the minimum, those two guys can mash in the run game. Maybe you can get the run game going behind those guys with Swift, Herbert, et cetera. Um, now, maybe it makes the left side a little weaker, but I like the idea of Jenkins and Wright playing next to each other, so I would consider that heavily. 
Number four, how about Karan Amagaji? Again, I'm not in the building. I don't know where he's at with his conditioning and just his NFL, you know, physical status of missing 10 months and just getting ramped up in the last month, month and a half. But you drafted this guy for a reason. Now, ideally, you didn't want to play him this year. But if it's going to be this poor, and this is probably not one you would try this week, but if you get a couple more weeks of this play, maybe you rotate him in for a series. And I'm against the rotating crap, but if you're this bad, try some different guys. And try him at guard or tackle. He played both in college. I think long-term you'd like him to be your left tackle if Braxton Jones doesn't work out. But um, try him at left guard. Maybe move Tevin to right guard, play Karan at left guard. He played left guard for a year at Yale. Um, he's powerful. We know that. So I would, uh, I would give him a look. If they feel like he's physically ready to go, put him out there. Third-round pick, man. Let's go. And then how about Doug Kramer? Do you give that a look? Now, my guess would be you wouldn't do that right now. Um, he's an undersized guy. He's not the most physical, uh, physically gifted guy. But we got to give Doug Kramer credit. He was on the practice squad for a couple years, gets cut last year, signs with another team. They bring him back on a futures deal. Not only does he have a great camp of preseason, he makes the roster. Coleman Shelton's been pretty bad. He's getting driven into Caleb's lap a lot. Um, so it's not like he's super powerful. Maybe Doug Kramer at least gives you something else in a different area. Now, I don't think against these big 330-pound defensive tackles he's going to hold up that well, but maybe he's a little bit more mobile. Maybe you can pull with him some, uh, certainly a couple different areas. Again, I doubt that'd be one you'd do this week, but if, it, if another two weeks goes by and it's ugly, I'd give him a look because Coleman Shelton has not been very good. So this is what I would do in week three. I would move Tevin to right guard by benching Nate Davis, and I would play Matt Pryor at left guard. I, I'm, I'm not making wholesale changes at once. I'm not throwing Kron Amagaji out there. I'm not benching Coleman Shelton yet. But I would bench Nate Davis and send a message there. I would move Jenkins to right side because uh, I like that pairing over there. And then I would plug in Matt Pryor at left guard who can play all four spots except for center on the offensive line. That's what I would try this week. Uh, whether or not they do that remains to be seen. Uh, something I wonder too, Larry Borum coming back in two weeks, does he factor into the mold or into the fold? He's eligible to come back. I guess we'll see if he's ready. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it can be status quo on the offensive line. I, I think you really have to dig deep here and try some different things. What old line changes would you make? What would you do? Um, explain in the comments. Would you bench Nate Davis? Would you move Tevin Jenkins? Would you sign somebody? Uh, let us know in the comment section down below what offensive line changes you would consider. All right, let's talk Bryce Young. Uh, some NFL news today. That was pretty surprising. The Panthers are benching the number one pick from last year just two weeks into the season. 18 starts into his career, 2-16. and 16. He missed one game last year. Already benched. And I know it's all doom and gloom right now. I don't think we should overreact too much to the Bears, albeit there are some issues that have uh, arisen to start this season. This trade – amidst all the frustration right now, is huge advantage Bears. Now, I know it's awkward with Darnell Wright coming off a bad game, Tyreek Stevenson, but I think we both feel like, or we feel like at least both those players are solid, right? Like Tyreek Stevenson we know can play. He's going to get beat some, but he can create takeaways. Darnell Wright's been solid for the most part, and obviously the jury's out on Caleb, but – even if he completely bust, this is still a win of a trade with everything else you got. You still get the second round pick next year. I mean, less than a season and a quarter, they're punting on Bryce Young. I mean, they've got to be in shambles in that building. Like, that is a disaster for Carolina. So, it's one of the worst trades for a team in history. Jury's out if it's one of the best trades ever for the Bears. Obviously, it's got to lead to high level of success for years to come. That hasn't happened yet, but... That's definitely a win for the Bears. There's no doubt about it. And Bryce Young, I, I don't know where his career goes from here. I think he's on a different roster next year fighting for a backup job, if I had to guess. And uh, it's just crazy how quick things can change because he was the number one pick, what, 18 months ago? Not even? I mean, that is – that's about as bad as it gets, man. So, uh, at least we're not Carolina. It can always be a lot worse, believe me. All right, thanks to everybody for tuning in to this episode of Chicago Bears Now. My name is Harrison Graham. Hit that subscribe button. We got you guys covered on a daily basis.